um, we're moving away from intrinsic membrane conductances to a, a receptor that I, that's near and dear to my heart, the, the dopamine receptor, uh, the D2 receptor specifically. Jennifer's uh, at UC Davis. She's moved recently, and she's going to take it away with D2 receptor trafficking. And she might be muted. She is muted. There we go. Am I, un am I unmuted? Yes. <laughs> all right. Let's get started. So this is going to be very different from all the other talks that we've had so far this morning. And I really want to start uh, by thanking the organizers for inviting me to, to participate in this. I think it's, for the next year at least, a lot of our lives are going to be like this remotely and learning, a steep learning curve of how we're going to communicate with each other effectively. Um, I also want to start here with this beautiful picture from Nora Volko's work that, that, like many of the projects in my lab, stimulated a conversation as to mechanism. And this is who I am, or really I'm a mechanism person. So you have this observation that, that you have this very pronounced and widespread loss of D2 receptor availability in drug abusers of all kinds. So this is a uh, pet image of the D2 and D3 receptors because the ligand doesn't differentiate in a drug abuser and somebody who is a sort of age-matched control. And this is really the, one of the few biomarkers we have of somebody who's a substance abuser. Right? We don't have a, a other biomarker or something that you can test your blood sugar like you can for diabetes or test your, your cholesterol levels if you've got heart disease. This is what we have, something very expensive and something that looks up the brain. And I think what's pretty remarkable about this is, is that it, it is across drug abusers of all kinds. So. To, Nicotine abusers, cannabinoid abusers, methamphetamine users, uh, ethanol abusers, they all show this decrease in D2 receptor availability in the, in the striatum. And this really led to our mechanistic question was that what is the mechanism that's actually responsible for this? And you can think about it in, in two broad ways. Was, was this person always like this with low D2 receptor availability and that's why they became a drug abuser? Or did they use drug? and that drove down D2 receptor expression. And experiments from Mike Nader's group in monkeys has shown us it's both of those things, that if you have low D2 receptor availability, you're more likely to seek drugs, but also if you start out like this and you take drug, you will downregulate the number of D2 receptors in your brain. So this really got us to this question of what could be the mechanism or mechanisms responsible for this drug-induced loss of D2 receptors. And it started with, with again, there's lots of ways you could change receptor number, but a very classical way and a very simple way and a way that leverages a mechanism that all cells use all the time is how you move membrane around in cells. So this is a very schematic, very uh, simplistic model of how receptors move around, G-protein coupled receptors in particular. And again, all five dopamine receptors are G-protein coupled receptors. So you bind to ligand, you signal to G-protein. If you are a D2 receptor, you're signaling to GI. If you're a D1 receptor, you're signaling to GS. And then following the activation of that G-protein, in response to your endogenous ligand, you undergo this cascade of events, which involves phosphorylation of the receptor, binding to this molecule called arrestin because it arrests the G-protein signal. That's why it was named that to begin with. It also acts as a adapter to take the receptor to clapper-encoded pits where they're endocytosed. Right, so now you're a receptor instead of on the membrane where you have access to ligand, dopamine in this case, you're in an endosome where you no longer have access to new ligand. And you have a choice to make here as to whether you're going to take this receptor and repopulate it on the plasma membrane or target it deeper into the sorting machinery into multivesicular bodies for eventual degradation in the lysosome. And what we now know is that among the dopamine receptors, different receptors make different choices at this stage. The D1 and D5 dopamine receptors are recycled. So they endocytose in response to dopamine and then are sent back to the plasma membrane, whereas the D2 and the D3 dopamine receptors are targeted for degradation in the lysosome. 
And this is just a, a example in heterologous cells of how we can measure that. So here we have cells expressing the D2 receptor or cells expressing the D1 receptor. We look at whether or not you endocytose in response to dopamine, and you do if you're a D2, and you also do if you are a D1. But if we keep dopamine present for a long period of time, the D2 receptors, this endocytose pool, that's this pool right here, is degraded. Whereas if you're a D1 receptor, that endocytosed pool is recycled, re-endocytosed, recycled, re-endocytosed, and not degraded. It remains stable even up to several hours of dopamine exposure. So the D2s are used to send this signal, endocytosed, and thrown away. And the D1 receptors are used to send the signal, endocytosed, and then used again and again. So this mechanism, this sorting mechanism, would be a way to regulate the levels of D2 receptor that would be, first of all, ligand dependent. So in constant, where you have high concentrations of dopamine, you're more likely to endocytose and degrade your receptor because you're gonna have more receptors occupied by the ligand. And so it, it has good face validity for something that would be drug dependent because in situations where you have very high dopamine tone, like when you're chronically taking drugs, you're much more likely to endocytose and therefore much more likely to degrade your D2 receptors. In fact, this turns out to be the case in mouse striatum, for example. You know, so we know what happens in humans from pet studies. We know what happens in monkeys from pet studies. We know what happens in mice too, that if you give mice five days of cocaine, you get this selective loss in the total number of D2 receptors. This is in striatum of mouse. And we also know that it has functional consequences. So this is the, the D2 current in a VTA cell from mouse, and you've got a nice big current here with, with uh, animals treated with saline for five days that is much, much smaller in animals treated with cocaine for five days. So you basically have lost the ability of D2, significantly decreased the ability of D2 to act in these dopamine cells in the VTA. And down here in the striatum, where a lot of this signal here, this, this is a saturation binding experiment looking for how many dopamine molecules, or in this case, uh, aticlopride molecules bind to the D2 and D3 receptors. You have a lot fewer of those, and this is probably a combination of both the presynaptic D2s that are on the terminals of the dopamine projection neurons and the postsynaptic D2 neurons that are in the, the medium spiny neurons, right? Because you're just grinding up the striatum and you're asking how many D2 receptors are there. And so we know this happens in heterologous cells. We know it happens in, in to changing total receptor number. And we know these changes in receptor number are actually affecting function in cells that at least those of us at this meeting care about, which are the cells that make dopamine. So could this sorting here, this loss, this post-endocytic sorting, so that is selectively a way to ch change the number of dopamine receptors, be responsible here for these drug-induced changes in receptor number and receptor function. So to ask that question, we have to first figure out why the D2s degrade when the D1s don't. Right? We have to de decipher the mechanism that's responsible for using these receptors to send a signal, but then throwing them away if you endocytose them. And we identified a protein we believe is responsible for that. We called it GASP for GPCR-associated sorting protein, where receptors have their last GASP when they bind to this molecule. And we've found that in every class of receptors that we've looked at, class by meaning dopamine receptors being a class, opioid receptors being a class, lots of other receptor classes, that there are members of the class that bind to this protein, GASP, and members that don't bind to GASP. And this is just a, again, a completely oversimplified version of the cell biology of how receptors are sorted, right? You endocytose, whether you're a green receptor or a red receptor, then you're in this sorting endosome, and here you are sorted. You're either pinched off and recycled, or you re are retained in this part of the sorting endosome that matures into the multivesicular body that then fuses with the lysosome, where the contents of this are then degraded. And what we know now is that among all these classes, including the dopamine class, we have members that are binding to GASP and getting degraded. And for the purposes of this talk, the critical receptors here are both D2 and D3. They both bind GASP, 
they're both retained in this maturing part of the sorting endosome, and they're, therefore they are both targeted for degradation in the lysosome. And we believe that that is mediated by the ability of GASP to bind to disbindin, which is again a, a, a protein that binds to lots of things, including GASP, and also to the escort machinery, which is part of how you move things deeper into this sorting pathway. So um, for, our, for our purposes, the D2s are gonna be the red ones, and the D1s are gonna be the green ones, where green is go, because you're gonna go, 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 and red is stop, because you're gonna get degraded and leave an endocytose. So what is the evidence that GASP actually sorts receptors to lysosomes? We have several lines of evidence, but I'm just gonna show you a couple. The um, important point here is mechanistically just because something binds to something and something else doesn't bind to something doesn't mean it actually does this job of degrading. So the first way we addressed that was using an shRNA where we knocked down the expression of GASP1. And we did that in cells that express the D2 dopamine receptor. And in cells, like I've already shown you, that have lots of GASP, you get Deg degradation after endocytosis, and in cells where we've knocked down expression of gas, selectively knocked down this gas, but not some of the other related proteins related to gas, we have a, we still get endocytosis of D2, but we don't get degradation of D2, because now the D2 receptors are actually recycling instead of getting targeted for degradation. The next question from there was to ask whether this targeting by gas, because now we are pretty sure it's mediated by gas, could be a mechanism responsible for this drug-induced loss of D2s that we see in humans, that we see in mice, that we see in monkeys, that is consistent across species and consistent across drugs of abuse. And so to address that, we made a mouse, we generated a mouse with a, both a conditional and a non-conditional knockout of gas. I'm going to talk a little bit about both of those. This first experiment is in the non-conditional knockout. So these mice have grown up in their lives with no gasp at all. And what we did is we compared the ability of cocaine to change the levels of D1 and D2 in wild type mice. I've already shown you this data that five days of cocaine is sufficient to drive down the number of D2 receptors in the striatum of mice. When we do that same experiment in mice that don't have this gas protein, we don't get this drug induced change in the levels of D2 and D3 dopamine receptors. So we've basically prevented this drug induced loss of D2 receptors by disrupting in the mice, eliminating in mice the GASP1 gene. So this has some pretty important implications that I don't think we've talked a lot about yet at this meeting in what's gonna to happen to signal transduction because, and I'll bring this up at the end again, you know, Wolfram asked this question, so what does dopamine do? So in my world, dopamine, what dopamine does is it activates dopamine receptors. Everything that dopamine does, it does by activating dopamine receptors. Everything. It can't do anything if there's not a receptor to bind to the, to the transmitter. And there are five dopamine receptors, right? So there are five receptors to respond to a single endogenous transmitter. And they come in two flavors. The inhibitory flavor, the GI flavor, and the GS flavor. So D1 and D5 are GS coupled, and D2, D3, and D4 are GI coupled. So why would nature do that? Why would nature give you five independent receptors, all with different affinities for dopamine, in two broadly different flavors that have opposite effects on neuronal excitability? And in my world, it does that because it it's, wants a way to, to have a very, very tight and sensitive control over what dopamine levels are like. This is gonna be super sensitive because you have five different receptors, all with different affinities for dopamine. So some of them are gonna be, gonna be, gonna be. Sorry, Jennifer, we can't hear you. Jennifer, stop. We can't hear you. Looks like maybe maybe there was a glitch, but maybe if you unmute and or mute and then unmute yourself again, maybe it'll work. Is she here? No, I think she's left. 
internet connection probably got lost. Yeah. Hi, Jennifer. All right, let's wait a few minutes to see if she can make it back because there is still a bunch of time left for her talk. Um, at this time, I would encourage you to ask questions if you have any, and the Q&A button is at the bottom. Uh, we'll still be collecting questions. Jennifer, you're muted now. Am I back? Yes. Okay. You're back. I'm Go back. Ahead. I'm back. Yeah, it's, um, yes. Okay. Uh, welcome to the world of three people in my household, all trying to use Zoom simultaneously. Um, all right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Let me share my screen. Share screen. PowerPoint, share. Are we back? On screen too? Yes. Yes, great, all right. So, Our hypothesis then was by changing this balance of the excitatory, that would be D1, which hasn't changed, and inhibitory, which now is lost, we have changed the balance of D1 versus D2 signaling, excitatory versus inhibitory dopaminergic signaling, and that this change in, this change in signaling, this change in balance is going to alter the ability of the plasticity in circuits important for addiction or other neuropsychiatric disorders where you have an imbalance in the D1 and D2 dopamine receptors. So again, I've already shown you this. This is the, the D2 BERT current in BTA dopamine cells in response to quinparol in, in mice, wild type mice that have seen no drug. They've only seen saline. And this is the response of the neurons in mice, wild type mice treated for five days with cocaine. So we've lost functional numbers of D2 dopamine receptors. And in the mice without GASP, the GASP1 knockout mice, we, we still have this GERT current, but cocaine does not make it go away, right? So we've basically prevent, prevented this functional loss, this cocaine-induced functional loss of D2 receptor signaling in the GASP knockout mice, which is cool because it tells us that this gap mechanism is this gas mechanism is actually working in these cells, these VTA dopamine cells that are producing the dopamine. And so what we wanted to do then was ask what was known about how drugs changed plasticity in these cells. And all the plasticity that had been studied in these cells when we started these experiments was glutamatergic plasticity, which again, to me, was a little bit of a crazy thing because wait a minute. Cocaine acts on the dopamine transporter, increases the amount of dopamine. Why are we looking at glutamatergic plasticity instead of what's actually happening at the level of the, the target of dopamine itself? So we wanted to connect these dots. We wanted to connect the dots of, we've changed glutamatergic plasticity in response to cocaine, but we know that had to have been mediated by the action of dopamine at a dopamine receptor, because that was the target of, of the drug of abuse. Right, so what changes in plasticity are known to occur in these cells? There are several. I'm only going to talk about one. I'm going to talk about this increase in the AMPA NMDA ratio. Right, so first, re first reported in 2001 by Anglis and Banshi, right, that you have with even a single dose of cocaine, this is actually five days of cocaine, but even a single dose of cocaine can change the AMPA NMDA ratio in these VTA dopamine neurons. And we knew that this effect was both dependent on NMDA receptors in those cells because it could be blocked by NMDA receptor blockers. And it was also dependent on activity at the D1 or the D5 because in the VTA dopamine neurons, it's actually a D5, not a D1 receptor, but still GS coupled. But if you didn't have these receptors, you didn't get this change in, if you blocked the D, either the D5 receptor or the NMDA receptors, you didn't get this drug induced change. And so here was our model when we started out of what we thought might be going on. So here we have our VTA dopamine neuron, not looking like a neuron, looking like a ball. Here is, because I'm studying the mechanism, here's the D1 receptor, or in this case, the D5, the GS coupled receptor. They also have the D2 receptor, the GI coupled receptor. And when you add cocaine, you obviously increase dopamine tone here because you're blocking the transporter that reuptakes the dopamine. And you're gonna activate both these receptors and minutes, those. Yep, I'll try to speed up here since I've, I'm a little behind. So this is gonna 
activated enolate cyclase. This is going to inhibit adenylate cyclase. And this one's going to be endocytosin recycled. And this one is going to be endocytosin degraded. And so as this is getting endocytosin degraded in the presence of this high level of dopamine, this signal is going to go down. This signal is going to win the battle at adenylate cyclase. You're going to have increased pKa activity, which is going to insert NMDA receptors, which then are going to cause an insertion of the ampho receptors. So that was our model. That's how you could have something acting at dopamine receptors altering glutamatergic plasticity. And this model made some very specific predictions. For example, that if you can't degrade the D2 receptors, this shouldn't happen. Because if you endocytosin recycle over here, you shouldn't get this happening, right? If, you, if you, this doesn't happen, this isn't going to happen, and that isn't going to happen. And that's, in fact, what we saw. So here, we, this, these are the floxed gas mice, where we've only knocked gas out of cells that express the D2 dopamine receptor. And in this case, we don't see this increase in the AMPA NMDA ratio in response to five days of cocaine. All right, so the GASP, obviously, I've already told you, interacts with many different receptors. And so genetic disruption of this is going to affect D2, but it's going to affect the levels of other G protein coupled receptors as well. So we wanted to figure out a different way, a D2 specific way to block this degradation of the D2 receptor. And we came up with a pharmacological way because it turns out we've got lots of drugs that activate the D2 dopamine receptor, including one called aripiprazole or Abilify, which activates G protein, not as well as dopamine, but is, so it's a partial agonist for G protein, but it does not drive endocytosis. And if you can't drive endocytosis, you can't drive degradation because this is a post endocytic sorting event. So again, a partial agonist does not recruit arrestin. So you don't get degradation and you don't get degradation because this drug, Abilify or aripiprazole, has a 500 fold higher affinity for the D2 dopamine receptor than dopamine does. So when Abilify is around, Abilify wins the battle for the receptor and it binds to the receptor, goes over there, replaces dopamine. And because of that, you're not getting endocytosis and you're, therefore you're not getting degradation. So when we do the same experiment, we have a very specific prediction here as well. Now over here, we're gonna get signaling from D1 and D2, and this is not gonna endocytose, so it's not gonna degrade. So we're not gonna have D1 winning this battle for pKa. We're not gonna get insertion of NMDA receptors and we're not gonna get a change in the ampa NMDA ratio. And that's exactly what we saw. So again, these animals got the same amount of cocaine they just had aripiprazole on board at the same time they had cocaine on board. So I'm out of time. So I'm, the take home message is gonna be here that GASP, yes, GASP is a universal mechanism for loss of D2s and D3s for multiple drugs. Here's the morphine example, just showing you that these are the D2 receptor levels, saturation binding in saline treated mice, in morphine treated mice. These are the wild type mice. These are the gas knockout mice. So you don't get this, this drug-induced loss of D2s with morphine either in these knockout mice. And the beautiful thing is that our, the behavior that I don't have time to tell you much about is we used a reversal learning paradigm to ask whether or not preventing loss of D2 receptors or promoting loss of D2 receptors changed your behavior on this reversal learning paradigm. So I won't go through the paradigm, but I'll just briefly show you the data that you can learn to associate the cue with the reward, even if you've had morphine. But if we change the rule, when we change the rule, we move the reward to a different odor here, animals treated with morphine are very, very bad at this task. They are very perseverative and they keep going back to where the reward was when they learned the task the first time. And if we do that same experiment in gas knockout mice, we do not see this, this deficit in, in reversal learning. And again, remember, you're losing D2 receptors here, and you're not losing D2 receptors here. Abilify rescues this as well. So if we treat these animals with Abilify for the last seven days of their abstinence period, we basically can reverse this, re learning, this reversal learning deficit. So we think this may actually have therapeutic utility as far as restoring D2 receptor numbers, not just in mice, but hopefully also in humans. So. Back to the question that Wolfram asked this morning, what does dopamine do? In my world, it activates dopamine receptors. And what, hopefully the take homes here is that you know now that when they're activated by dopamine, D1s recycle, D2s are degraded. 
a change in this balance promotes both glutamatergic plasticity and dopamine neurons, and it also produces changes in cognitive flexibility even after we've had a, a month of abstinence after your arm morphine treatment. If we prevent these changes in balance, either genetically in the gas knockouts or pharmacologically with aripiprazole, we can prevent or reverse the behavioral and synaptic plasticity. And this sort of has implication that biased agonists, by bias I mean they signal to G protein but don't drive endocytosis, could prevent the loss of D2 receptors that are associated with either drug or dopamine agonist use. I would like to leave you with the compelling question that antagonists at D2 receptors, so antagonist drugs at D2 receptors are used for many indications, mostly psychosis and bipolar disorder. These are also going to change or could also change D2 receptor number. They're not just blocking G protein function, they're blocking receptor endocytosis in response to dopamine as well. So they're going to prevent any kind of dopamine-induced degradation of the D2 receptors as well. So their function isn't just to block G protein function. And I'll skip my future directions to go and thank my team. And so this is all of us dressed up at Halloween as all different food puns. So when you go and look at my slides later, you can try to figure out which food pun each of us is. I am the deviled egg here. And then you can see if you can figure out everybody else. Thanks. Great, Jennifer. Um, we, because uh, we're, we're really close on time. Uh, sorry, Paulina. Maybe there is time for a couple of questions. Carry on, girl. Okay, thank you. So we have a question from Genevieve Yuzunova, and she's um, saying, hi, Jennifer. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Since the D2 receptor have a long and a short isoform, have you determined whether gas binds to both isoforms? Yes, it binds to both isoforms, and we think equally well to both isoforms. Brilliant. Um, we have a question from Asha Lahiri, and she's asking, how long does it take for a dopamine receptor to get recycled? Do you have any insights into how that time course might affect neurons' ability to respond to prolonged dopamine application? It's a great question. And um, John Williams, right here, you may be able to answer that as well as I can. But you can see the rapid desensitization as the receptors are endocytosed. And it takes, in our hands, about 20 minutes for us to recover D1 receptor function after this desensitization. Now, it's a little bit dose-dependent, right? So if you have a massive dose of dopamine or quinparol or pick your favorite agonist and you drive massive amounts of endocytosis, it takes longer to all, for all those to recycle than if you only endocytose half of your receptors. And John Williams has done some beautiful work with this with dopamine receptors and and mu opioid receptors, looking at that, where you, you, know, you, you pulse with a small dose of, of agonist, then you give a massive dose of agonist, and then you watch recovery to the small dose of agonist. And that's the way you can really measure kinetically in a slice the recycling. Now, of course, that's in slice. That's not in vivo. We don't know really in vivo how quickly it happens. Um, there is a question from Gaurav Chaturi, and he's asking, what happens if you give a repeated high dose of some other rewarding stimuli? like sucrose, is it similar to receiving a drug like cocaine or is there something specific to the cocaine molecule itself that's responsible for this phenotype? Yeah, so we, so the only experiments we've done is to, to give the animals the choice of something like a rewarding, like sucrose in their home cage for prolonged periods of time, right, where they can drink that. And we do not see a loss of D2 receptors in, in those circumstances. So again, the what else could we do that would be rewarding? We do see endocytosis, or people have seen endocytosis of receptors in response to naturally rewarding stimuli like food and sex. So they are getting endocytosed. But are as many of them getting endocytosed? Are as many of them occupied by dopamine as when you have something like cocaine, which is blocking reuptake of dopamine and dramatically changing the amount of transmitter? And the answer to that is probably no, because in the natural rewarding, you're getting release of dopamine, you know, vesicle fusion, synaptic release. But then you have time to recover before the next, before the next fusion event. And probably the last question given the time. So we have a question from Joe Libovitz and he's asking, what is the time scale of drug induced D2 receptor loss? So in mice, we can see it within 
three days. It's more dramatic at five days than three days. We're not using a huge dose of drug here. So we're not pelleting animals with like 100 milligram pellets of morphine, right? We're giving a pretty moderate dose and seeing a dramatic loss. And we know that loss lasts at least 30 days in mice. So it's, it doesn't require a huge amount of drug and it's pretty persistent. It takes time for you to repopulate your neurons with the D2 receptors. In humans, we don't know. Right? We can't do, really do that experiment in humans. Uh, maybe one last question from William Sanchez, and he's asking, do you know if D2 receptor loss affect equally the autoreceptors and the postsynaptic receptors? Also an excellent question, and we have some pre very preliminary evidence that, that the, the dopamine neurons, the VTA dopamine neurons, have a lot of gasp, so you rapidly lose your autoreceptors because of the gasp in those neurons. And there's either very little or no gasp in the postsynaptic, in the medium spiny neurons that have D2. Right, so you're selecting, we think that loss that, that we're just measuring when we grind up the striatum is primarily loss of the D2 autoreceptors and not the postsynaptic D2 receptors. Brilliant, thank you very much. That's a very hard experiment to do. <laughs>